and then we'll just be hanging out while it bakes. That works. So Today, on Black Tie Kitchen, <laughs> we're making Boss Bitch Biscotti. I haven't actually been able, haven't had to use one of those. Look, it's a, very, it's a very basic affair in my house, okay? That's what I said. Like, I got a hand mixer as a KitchenAid. That's about the fanciest I've... Well, the, the hand mixer I have is actually my mom's old one. Or I think it's actually my grandmother's. It's like the 1980s, like that brown, nasty color looking type thing. Yeah. It's just, it just works. <laughs> yes. and I think the, the things are perfect. rusting. Like, it's funny. Are we technically going? Yeah. No, oh, sort of <laughs> It's whatever goes. I have an engineer background, which is very important for when you need to arrive to the kitchen aid and determine how you're going to get it going. So you're an engineer by pre-trade? Pre-trade? Yeah, so I have a master of engineering. Okay. Yeah, so master of engineering and industrial engineering and engineering management. So that's kind of my background. I started out as a uh, bachelor of engineering for aerospace and I was doing that for a scholarship opportunity and uh, I took that scholarship opportunity. Making a lot of noise here, just a lot of- No, it's, it's, there's, there's, the, the noise is not, doesn't um, get picked up. Just gonna get everything kind of cut up here. Um, there we go. Alright. I'm like a, a pre setup kind of girl. <laughs> That's one of those things that in cooking all these videos, it's. I feel like when you have all these recipes, cooks and stuff, doing all these videos, they don't tell you, oh, like, oh, just add some bacon. Like, well, you didn't calculate the 20, 30 minutes it takes to cook that bacon. You just added right. it. You like, just, it just 20 minute go. meals is not really 20 minutes. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I don't like while I'm talking, I'm just like, what's that? Can you hear me? <laughs> It's actually not that bad. You'd be surprised. <laughs> Although syncing the audio afterwards is a pain in the ass. Oh, I bet. For some reason, I don't know why. What do you use? Do you use a uh, just Adobe? Adobe suite of, of all products, the stuff. Oh, it's pretty so much. Big. It's so good. I love that stuff. I got it too. I um, so my husband's getting his master of uh, education, and so he's technically still a student. So I get the student <sighs> discount. Oh yeah. I just got off that student discount, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> like. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's, it's so great. I mean, it's still worth like the max amount, but. It's still crazy. Though. It's like if if only I could use just one piece of software, not the three or four that I need. It's yeah. It'd be so much cheaper. It's painful. All right, so eight. I think it's eight. Yeah. Yeah, and then ten. You just bat it all in there. Butter is never a bad thing. Yeah. All right. I'm just going to throw it all in here. Is that cool? Yeah. Excellent. But yeah. So, um, should I introduce myself to do all that good stuff first? Are you just going to add yeah. it later? You can start. I don't know. Some people like to do it later. Be like, and today my guest is. No, well, you can do it now. It doesn't okay. matter. Great. It's pretty right. pretty rough around the edges. This is a. So as we get going today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm Emily Elmore. I am originally an Air Force pilot coming out of Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. I have a Bachelor of Science in Aerospace and then a Master of Engineering. I am in no way um, a cook or a baker, only the 10-minute, uh, the 15-minute 15 specials that a mom can do for a two-year-old who Which is, is it's important. an insane little person who wants to eat it now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So yeah, but here today we're going to be making some, what I like to call boss bitch biscotti because I am always on the run. I have to get out of the house immediately. And just like I told you earlier today, I am usually looking for a place to get coffee. And if I can have a little biscotti to go, it's mm. a choice. So I like to say when you've got to go run the day, right, then you can go get yourself some uh, boss biscotti. bitch biscotti. Yeah. It All works. Right. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, I, um, like I said, I'm Air Force pilot. I actually ended up injuring uh, my arm pretty severely. And as a result, I can no longer fly. I'm looking to be medically retired here in the next couple of months. And my next big move is um, to continue uh, developing folks and helping to mold those that are looking to be in leadership positions, both from a personal standpoint and also from a organizational standpoint. So that's my next my next move. It's called the Moto Doll. So check it out at themotodoll.com. Um, Flash like across the bottom. <laughs> it is a performance brand. So like I said, both personal and professional. Um, if you're looking to either develop 
uh, yourself or your teams, and that's what I'm doing. I'm taking that 10 years um, being in a very um, high speed, high stakes, no fail environment. To high speed, low drag. That's as they say. right, exactly. Um, you know, these places where you can't fail up at 30,000 feet or else, you know, everybody's pink tushy is going to go right into the ground. So at that point, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if you've got conflicts of interest or, you know, you've got some kind of bias that exists between your team. You've got to mm -hmm. be able to very quickly stamp it out and get the mission done. So people experience that stuff in the work environment all the time. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, that I'm is sure an understatement. It. Oh, it's unbelievable. Yeah. I yeah. see it every day. It's pretty, pretty marvelous, actually, to witness firsthand. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's see, we'll take this one out. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong butter. <laughs> the wrong one in. I said right, not a professional. How do people talk and do this at the same time? It's a lot more difficult than you think. It takes some time. It's I still don't have it. And it's taken me yeah eh, fifty episodes, I think, <laughs> at this point. Okay, so we've got our butter. We've got sugar, which is how much sugar do we need? One and a third cup. Oh. So fans of Black Tie Kitchen, get excited for one episode only. You get to see the use of sugar, actual, real, granulated sugar, not the it's fake crazy. stuff. It's crazy. Put into it's funny because I told a couple of people who were making biscotti, like like keto biscottis, low carb biscottis. I'm like, no, no, they're real stuff, and they're like, real. what? Like, like, yeah. but now I don't get to enjoy it. Well, you should have a good diet. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll, it'll pair really well with the coffee, like you're saying. That's right. It'll be exciting. That's right. you know, so I've got a lot of friends that actually do keto, and they love it. And what I didn't realize is that keto actually started as, like, a brain diet. So that's pretty neat. So I guess that folks that were dealing with, um, like, epilepsy prior mm -hmm. to really good epilepsy drugs um, were given this diet because of the way the brain absorbs um, fats and ketones or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, as opposed to sugars. But everybody that, like, has really done it, hasn't done some kind of modified keto, mm -hmm. uh, apparently really does see some, um, you know, focus and all that kind of stuff, so. Well, it really depends, too, like, if the person was healthy before or not and that kind of thing. Right. Because some people like, oh, I lost, like, 400 pounds. And it's like, well, you were also eating, you know, McDonald's before, so it's kind of... Right. McDonald's and extra large fries and <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and cut so all that stuff out. I'll say uh, I like to tell everybody that the best diet I ever went on was pregnancy, um, which <laughs> you know, like you, you gain like thirty five pounds when you're growing a baby, and then you get rid of the baby, and you don't lose all of that weight. That's the trick. You don't lose all of that weight. So when you have that baby, that's like a little eight pound baby. So you're like, yeah, I'm like 160 pounds. I'm huge. I'm just going to have this baby. 60 pound baby. And then I'm going to like lose all 30 pounds. And that's not what happens. If you lose like 10 pounds, you're like, what am I doing? I'm still like 150, Ugh. right? Plus you still have all that water that's in your system, mm -hmm. especially if you were on like an IV or something, right? If you had like a C-section or if you had any kind of thing. So for your lady viewers that are out there, they're like, yeah, yeah, no, I know. Like, what are you talking about? This good diet is pregnancy. But, uh, but no, like it really was pretty great because um, I ended up um, being able to breastfeed my kids, which was wonderful, and it used up a mass amount of calories, and I got to eat all the things, all the things. Like I would just, this whole thing of sugar, and it would be fine, right? Because you got to like produce the milk for the kids. And so it was absolutely wonderful, but I ended up having a totally different um, exchange with food. Like I was no longer, because prior to being pregnant and prior to, um, you know, hurting my arm, which we can talk a little bit about too. Mm -hmm. But prior to all of that, I was um, competitive in MMA and jujitsu and Muay Thai. And so I had um, like this very, I don't know, I would say almost obsessive relationship with food because mm -hmm. it was all about performance and then you have to cut weight to compete. And so you get kind of weird with it. And I had this weird relationship, but then all of a sudden now the performance was, you know, making window. sure. Yeah, that everything was like, uh, equal and excellent for the growth of the baby. And so at that point, it's like, oh, if I really feel like I'm needing fat, then I was just, I was making sure that I was eating good fats. And if I felt like I needed more protein, then I would make sure I would eat more protein. And all of a sudden, like now, I was really paying attention to my body. How do I drop this down? How do you, so you just like, no, uh, this, raise it up. Here it is. Uh -huh. Perfect. I forgot about that. So were you just like, oh, I need more meat. Like, yeah. <laughs> time to get a, right. a ham bone. 
Yeah, and like it was actually red meat. So then I started eating, which I never ate red meat before, mm. but I was very clear. I was like, oh, I need red meat. And then I went to the, the next time I had a doctor's appointment and she was like, oh yeah, like you're a little anemic, right? Like they did mm. their blood stuff. And it was like, oh great. So I realized that if I just really paid attention to my body, um, you know, that I could probably be able to meet most of the things that I needed. And so now I eat pretty much um, whatever I want, but now it's just very like paying attention to portion sizes, mm-hmm. and then also making sure it's like, oh, I, I really enjoy uh, not eating salad. I have never liked salads, but I'm like, you know what? It's been like three or four days. I should probably have a salad. And then if it's not a little voice in my head going like, Bleh, salad, right? <laughs> then if it's like, oh yeah, salad's all right. Then I'm like, yeah, okay, cool, let's have a salad, right? So it's, yeah, it's one of those things where uh, salads are like they suck until you haven't had them for like couple weeks and all you've had yeah. is just bread and meat let's say and then you, you, that's right. you're like i kind of crave that green stuff it's just refreshing yeah you have vanilla oh shoot yes come on Sorry. while you're doing that i'll keep talking um all right so with our boss lady biscotti let's see we've got our eggs and sugar and butter and let's see we need a little bit of vanilla and then we'll need flour, baking powder, and salt. So I'll also need baking powder and salt, if that's not already out. Yes. Yeah. It's like Julie and Julia would be like, and now we pour, what was this? Hold on. <laughs> How much vanilla do I need? Oh no, I think you're fine. Teaspoons. A teaspoon. So do you cook often or no? Yeah, I really like to cook. I just, um, it, it really is kind of... Um, time. Uh, yeah, time constrained and also time proven family recipes. Mm-hmm. So I like to make um, stuff that I can just kind of pull stuff together really quick. I don't have to look at recipes mm-hmm. and then just throw it in the oven and then it's ready to go. So like meatloaf, like what are you, t- what are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, I do some meatloaf, I do some enchiladas, some Mexican casserole. Mm. I've got a lot of family from Texas, so it's a lot of Tex-Mex. Um, so that was probably the most frequent of them. And then um, we've also got a lot of really great stews that we do. And mm. um, I'm trying to think like... Quesadillas? I mean, that goes in Spanish <laughs> stuff. Um, yeah, no, so just kind of that easy stuff to make. Plenty of pastas, chicken parm, stuff like that. That's mm-hmm. just, you can grab it, beat it out, do the stuff real quick that you know, so to speak. <laughs> and then, um, you know, just the easy stuff that you know, and then throw it in the oven, like I said, to kind of heat up and get all bubbly and cheesy and delicious for the kids. And then yes. bring that out. Yeah. Choice. Mm. Yeah. All right, so we got the vanilla, and then now we need three and a quarter cups. So how long did you fly C-130s for? So I was a Herc pilot for... Herc is short for Hercules. That's right, yes, for the Hercules. <laughs> C-130. That comes from Hercules. all, all right. my video game play. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He knows because he's a Call of Duty expert. Well, I used to be. I actually used to be, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a pilot, but then I realized I was too blind and too too big to be a pilot. So I was like, oh, maybe I'll be an aerospace <laughs> engineer. And then I was like, ah, like, that's oh, that way really too sucks. much math. Yeah, I was like, a ah. lot of work. That's like, true. Like, yeah, I'll just deal with computers. <laughs> Let's see. Half a cup. So you were a Herc pilot. One cup for nine just years. Nine years. Yeah, well, a pilot in general for nine years. Uh, the Herc, I started flying in 2012 and then stopped flying in, well, I guess it was like 2016. Yeah, so because I went in um, originally. Let's see. That was, I just want to make sure. I got counting. It's very important work here. Eight. Six. <laughs> Person, I think that was two, uh, three, whatever. Look, this thing will tell us, right? Yeah. It's close enough. Yep. It's going to be terrible because we're talking while we're doing this. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I actually um, got to do a joint undergraduate pilot training with the Navy to start. And they go a little bit longer because they don't do it by class. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's important to know because <laughs> if you're uh, going in like while well, in the Air Force, so I'm Air Force, um, but then whenever you're doing a joint program, it takes longer, like almost twice as long. So as a result, I didn't graduate until 2012, even though I started to fly in 2010. Right. So I didn't start flying Herx, mm-hmm. Hercules until 2012. 
Okay. Yeah, but it was still really great because I got to experience both the Navy side and I was actually in the Marine Squadron. Um, and it was a very different experience from what my bros on the Air Force side going through pilot training went through. Mm -hmm. And I would like to say it was a lot more fun. It's not that there were less rules because they can see this because this is public domain <laughs> information. It's not that there were less <laughs> rules, but I like to say that the Navy and the Air Force go about the rules uh, a little bit differently. So mm -hmm. one of them has, um, if it's explicitly listed, then it's usually a, one of those thou shalt nots, right? Mm -hmm. It's like written in blood, like somebody died as a result of that rule. Um, so that rule is written to keep your butt safe. Um, so if it is not explicitly written to not do it, then the world is your oyster, right? Go fly, do it. Um, but on the other end of that, like the Air Force, all of their rules are thou shalt. So you must explicitly do all of those things. Mm. And if it's not written in there, don't go trying something new just because it's not in there, right? So that's kind of the way that they, they approach this. So it's like, here's a rule of do nots and here's the rules of the of book of yes, you will do right. this. Yeah, and so I remember coming from the Navy side and then going to the Air Force side and they're like, hey, you, uh, you did this formation rejoin like this way, you know, where does it say to do that? And I'm like, well, in this chapter and this page, it says to do it in this way. <laughs> I thought that this way would be better and it didn't say don't do it. <laughs> That's that's really interesting, like yeah. that that approach. And they're that like, approach. oh god, and they're like, no, nope, Navy, just squash that right away. Huh. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's like, nope, don't do that. Right. All right, well, <laughs> let's yeah, not do exactly. that next mission. <laughs> yeah, right. And it's like, well, you guys should really like thoroughly describe like why we can't do it that way. And it's like, or write a rule that says why you can't do it that mm -hmm. way. But this, you know, this rule is like it's recommended that you do this. And so it's like, well, if it's just a recommendation. I'm choosing to disregard your recommendation because okay. this way is better. I see your advice and I reject it. Right. So we're basically just mixing flour with the... Yeah, so Did right you add now, the we've vanilla got... Nary? What's that? Did you add the vanilla to it? That's right. So okay. we have the butter, the eggs, the sugar, and the vanilla in there. And right now we are slowly mixing in the flour. Just kind of a standard cookie recipe, you know, mm. which is that's so great. I mean, if you didn't know, it could be a, you know, like a sugar cookie recipe. Huh. So the really the only difference with biscotti is that it's twice baked. Really so that's, I've always wondered how they got it so hard. I thought it was some sort of special concoction of for... something. Yeah, no, it's just being uh, twice baked. So basically, making your cookies stale before they go stale. So it's kind of like croutons. Yeah. It's it's the crouton of the cookie world. That's right. It's exactly what it is. <laughs> Here's a cookie, I'll cook it again. Yeah, it's a curtain cookie. <laughs> <laughs> so then you stopped, or you, you weren't, you didn't stop because you wanted to, but flying. Right, so then uh, I was noticing I was getting a little bit of a pain inside of my uh, right shoulder. And at the time I was also competing um, in my sport. So I think I was just really doing jujitsu and uh, I hadn't really done Thai in a little bit because I had been experiencing some biceps tendon pain. At that point, I'd already been experiencing that. And so um, I didn't really want to do like any, uh, what's called a heart, you know, like a, like a right hand. So doing like a hook. I didn't mm, want to yeah. do a hook, right? Um, because every time I impacted, I was experiencing quite a bit of pain. And then I was doing jujitsu and I started to experience some pain in my shoulder also. And I was like, man. All right, um, you know, I've probably got to get this looked at pretty soon. And then I was flying, and while I was flying, like doing all the overhead maneuvers, we're just getting to the point where it was just, you know, really terrible. So, because um, all of your buttons are overhead mm -hmm. as a pilot. So, um, I was experiencing that kind of pain, went to the doc, thought that he would get me on some good physical therapy routine, did kind of a standard x ray, and they saw that I've got really, uh, really terrible shoulder dysplasia. And then on top of it, I had torn my biceps tendon and my labrum. So, um, yeah, so long story short, because of all the tears and the uh, underlying bone deformity, mm -hmm. um, I now have had multiple surgeries. I've had um, all of those tendons repaired several times. I also have a joint replacement. And then I had nerve damage, which resulted in me being unable to fly. So, kind of see me not using my right arm very much like to tell everybody it's for decorative use only. It can do this. It can kind of do this. But the minute that that elbow starts to move away and it starts to require more shoulder strength, I just don't have it. Mm. So, 
So yes, we'll probably uh, need your assistance in taking this down and yes. rolling it out as soon as we get the rest of the stuff. But I think we're almost, we're almost there. I think we just need to put the almonds and. So see. do you add the almonds in there now or? No. Oh yeah, yeah, you put that in now. So the almonds and the chocolate chips. And then I think the only thing is the baking powder and the salt. Is that out here? No. Okay. Well, the salt is right there. Right here? Yeah, it's that big white container. Oh yeah, I see, okay. Fancy. Yeah, that's cool. So three quarter teaspoon. So we do one, two, and three. And we also do one tablespoon of this stuff. And so now with the fact that you're not flying anymore. You're doing the whole, the whole, the whole, uh, moto thing, right? The whole kind of, yeah. So my, movement. yeah, my great next big step is the moto doll, which is that performance brand that we were talking about. And, um, and yeah, it's taking all of those leadership lessons that I learned along the way and applying them now, but just outside of the cockpit. So taking everything, um, you know, in the cockpit and under the hood, because I used to be a little bit of a motorhead myself, um, taking all of those lessons and then applying them in either personal or professional, um, you know, environment to get the kinds of outcomes that people are looking for. Because what I have found most often is that when people find that there's, um, you know, uh, displeasure or angst or anything having to do with, you know, kind of like negativity um, about a current situation is oftentimes because there's a disconnect between what we expect and what our current reality is. Mm -hmm. And because of my engineering background and because of my military background, I have found a lot of ways to adapt and overcome and to apply tried and true uh, methodologies that will help you to go from that current reality into that you know, expectation or mm -hmm. to find modifications that you know, are a good alternative to maybe what you thought was going to happen or at least to get you a good timeline and you know, better measure steps along the way to determine exactly um, when you may reach those goals. Mm -hmm. So what if it's the curveball? What if it's something that intrinsically, you know, somebody can't achieve? Like for example, say somebody who's got the like no legs, like I'm gonna run a marathon. Like, well, maybe. Yeah. So then we can talk about like modifications. So first off, we'll determine what the motivation for that particular goal is. Right? So if somebody who has no legs wants to run a marathon, is it that they really want to run a marathon or is it that they want to do something that surpasses what everyone else's expectations of them are, that they want to be able to demonstrate that they have the same level of um, like physical capability that they had prior to uh, whatever led up to that particular situation or if they've never had legs, just to say that, hey, look, I'm just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. I can choose to run a marathon and train to run a marathon and still run a marathon. And at that point, if, it's, if that's what it really is, then there may be more than one thing than just that, right? And if they run that marathon, but people still see them with their limitation, they may be like, man, I'm doing this stuff, but yet I don't feel satisfied, mm -hmm. right? Then that's the big thing too. It's like, all right, the only reason that you're doing it is because of this core reason. Like you need to get down to like the fundamental reason why you have a very particular goal. So once you understand that, then you'll feel satisfaction upon either completing the goal or in completing a goal that satisfies the motivation for having it to begin with. So for me to say, well, I want to fly an airplane again. Hey, guess what? You know, sugar cake, like you just, you can't, not at least the way that I am, right? Mm -hmm. But yet there's all sorts of modifications I could potentially do to go and be in another aircraft. Or I could make sure that I'm going into a two seat aircraft, right? Mm -hmm. um, not a single seat aircraft. So an aircraft that has, um, you know, two sets of controls and make sure that I'm going up with somebody who is also just as qualified as I am because I feel that I'm pretty confident like with one hand I could do most of the stuff but there are some things that I wouldn't be able to do and there are some emergency actions that I would definitely not be able to do mm -hmm. so if my goal is just to go up into an airplane because I miss the thrill of flying you know like with the controls in my hands then I can probably modify my current situation to go and experience that but if my motivation is to show that I have the same level of autonomy as I did before, that I can go into a single seat 
just like I did before. Alexa, stop. <laughs> then that is now that like that is where I may not be able to reach that goal. Mm-hmm. And that is where you've really got to discover like what it is that you want because I may be able to get up in the air again, but if my true like the the thing that I really want to prove to myself and to everybody else is that I have the same level of autonomy now that I had before, I've got to find a different way to do it. Mm-hmm. So that's what I like to bring up with people is that there isn't necessarily any one particular thing that you can or can't do. You have to find out like the root of why you want to accomplish a particular thing. And then from that, if there's an action that can be made in order to meet that, you're going to be just supremely satisfied. So. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah. All right, now well, is where I need your help. All right. Or well, I guess we can do, we can do these and... I like to kind of fold these in, but we'll do it this way because I got this. Because I got this and it's fancy. The stand and mixer is legit. Yep. You know what I'm saying? It's like you just gotta, like, what feels good? That's about as many almonds as I would like. A little less of these. I'm not, like, super into it. Excessive chocolate by biscotti. Just a little bit. I always end up like just eating these by themselves, like so good. instead of like Hershey's and stuff. All right, cool. All right, now it's all you. Then we'll just kind of. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so we can we can do a little exercise with you if you want. What is something like? What is a, a current goal that you have? That's a good question. I know you're on, you're on the spot. Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. Yeah, so we can use something maybe <laughs> like as an example your YouTube mm-hmm. channel, which is something that has like very specific metrics, I'm sure, that you can monitor and track. And so, I mean, do you want it to be like the next big sensation? Do you want to have like a million viewers? Or is um, this more just for like personal satisfaction for you to engage in an activity that you really enjoy and get to share it with other people? in here uh, it's a little bit of both it's more just like a creative outlet type of thing and then yeah. as far as recognition not really if it happens it happens but. so a little so a little bit of both here i'm gonna let you wait so then you probably experience quite a bit of satisfaction in terms of the creative outlet right because you have yeah. everything set up and you've able to bring people in and meet new folks and talk about new things yeah. so i'm sure that, that probably is met more or less the creative outlet part of it. Yeah, if I don't do something creative, I get kind of a little, little, little stir crazy. crazy. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's good. So then, <laughs> so then now, like the other piece of that would probably be, you know, reaching your goals on like the, you know, being able to reach more people because this is something that brings you great satisfaction and you want to be able to reach as many people as you can because then you can positively in, or in, or them, right? in positively. Yeah. <laughs> I pissed me off so much. Yeah. I started my own thing. That's right. <laughs> okay. So we'll take a quick little break from that. We we'll just need to pull this out and then put it into two separate loaves. Okay. Mm-hmm. Just roll it out, or? Yeah, just just kind of put it into like a big lump. Can we eat this raw? I guess we could eat it raw. It's kind of like uh, yeah. cookie dough. Yeah, we totally can. Which is, it's so is funny how it's, cookie dough is always better than the cookie. Yeah. It's never the other way around. Like, well, it's never worth the wait. <laughs> well, maybe we'll get lucky. Maybe today's the day. <laughs> well, but then again, this isn't like a chocolate chip cookie, though. It's not. Okay. Chocolate chip cookies. Not worth the cookie. Yeah, this is, uh, like, the joy of this is really dipping it in the coffee. I don't think I've ever done that. With your biscotti? I, well, because I've never really, I mean, biscotti was always like... Kind of this gross, crunchy, crouton, yeah, crouton of the cookie Yeah, because it was one of those things like when my parents would buy and I was just like, ah, oh, these are not very good. Like, this is just this nasty, hard cookie. But they weren't very good. Biscotti yeah. was prepackaged. All right, so Boss Bay biscotti is going to be delicious. It's going to change your mind about biscotti. Oh, for sure. I mean, I've had good biscotti scent. I just never... Yeah. But the whole trying to... Eat kind of healthy. This. Oop. Yeah, so this is also like perfect consistency. It's good. It's like I wasn't sure if that was going to turn out that way because I kind of lost count of how many. 
<laughs> scoops. Too much flour. Scoops of flour. And I'm like, oh, it's good. This thing's labeled. It's fine. It's no big deal. Yeah, so... I don't. I wouldn't say that I eat biscotti like on its own. It is a morning drink, and what was so nice about it is that she can put it into like an airtight container, mm -hmm. and because it's like meant to be hard, it's yeah, it is pretty dense. Yeah, it's good for I mean like weeks, which is awesome. So how did you get into like MMA and Muay Thai and that sort of stuff? So I used to do wrestling as a kid. I uh, got into that in middle school. All of, I was very much a tomboy. All of my friends um, did wrestling. They all did football too. I thought I would do football because we all played football uh, like during recess. It was just a way to hang out with them more. But the football coach, um, you know, he came out and basically said that he didn't care if I was any good. He wasn't going to play me. Girls didn't play on his team. He said that. So I was like, oh, all right, that's cool. Um, but like I said, it was still kind of like a way. I, I wasn't really friends with. Uh, many of the girls and so playing on a sports team with them just didn't seem nearly as much fun to me as you know getting to spend time with my bros and so uh, I ended up going and said to the wrestling coach and asking him I'm like hey you know coach so-and-so said this um, you know like I'm not here to screw around like I, I really enjoy sports and I'm you know pretty athletic but I you know want to be able to play sports with my friends right mm -hmm. my friends are like all these people, players on your team. And so it's like, yeah, okay, like if you work hard, then you know, I'll let you I'll let you compete. And I was like, oh, sweet. So I ended up wrestling and it was this really great experience and the whole team rallied around me. Like even um, some of the dads that were like, no, nah, I don't want this. Cause it was a, it was a boys team, mm -hmm. you know? So like, I don't want this girl on my team, you know, my boys team. But even those guys, you know, I mean like they, they really did, they were great. Like they gave me wrestling shoes and they, you know, like just like worked, you know, worked extra time with me and um, I only lost once, and it was actually at a state competition, mm -hmm. and I got to be, so I was actually an alternate going into the state competition, <laughs> and I was not ready to be there by any means. It was like my first year, like, doing it. It was like seventh oh, that's, grade. That's, yeah. Oh, yeah. And so <laughs> I was like, oh, no, because I was an alternate, and my buddy, uh, he ended up getting, like, sick beforehand, so I was, I was like, hey, guess what? It's you. You know, like, the 103 pounders. Time, time to rise. Yeah, and um, anyway, and it was just, like, this really great mental exercise, right? Like getting there, it's like, okay, like I'm here, I'm trained up, I'm pretty good, you know, like I'm all right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just go in and, and do your thing. And I had dealt with a lot of BS from some of the other coaches, you know, like, uh, like what are you doing here kind of thing. And so I would say that going there was like just this really awesome, like I said, like mental exercise. And then when I was there, actually, I, I talk about this in a couple different places, but, um, this has stuck with me forever. So I've never like really mentally quit out of a lot of, I, I would say like the only time I can actually ever really remember mentally quitting something was this one particular time at this state competition. Mm -hmm. This, this guy that I was wrestling was way better than me, way better than me, way stronger than me. Uh, and I knew that going into it and I had done so well up until that point and realizing just like how underprepared I was um, overwhelmed me. Mm -hmm. And it was like this moment of paralysis where I was like, oh, no, right? Like, I'm not ready to be here. Mm -hmm. And I just, it was just like for, for a second, but he saw it, you know, like this guy saw it being right, right there, right? Like while we're wrestling and he took advantage of it and he pinned me. So not only had I not lost before, now I also got pinned and it was just like this incredible, like horrible crushing defeat. And not because he had beat me, even though he probably would have mm -hmm. either way. But if I had gone out, you know, just if he had beat me, I would have been okay with it. But he beat me because I beat myself mm -hmm. first, right? Like mentally. Um, anyway, and so that always stuck with me too, like in everything else that I did. So I wanted to chase that again. I wanted to find something that could challenge me in the same way um, as that. And then we had moved um, in high school. I I'd moved to a different school. And so I didn't want to go through kind of the whole pain in the butt of convincing the teammates and the teammates' dads that I deserve to be there, right? Like all over again, mm -hmm. um, especially now that we're like squarely in high school and puberty hits and I'm kind of like this very delicate, pretty little girl. And so it's like, um, what are you doing here? Kind of thing, right? So I just avoided wrestling, but I'd always wanted to get back to it. And so um, I actually, or at least some kind of combat sport. So I asked my mom like, hey, can I, can I do like boxing or something? And she said, 
no. We're from the South. She's like, no. Did you see what she's like, this? No. Like, you're not getting your face pounded in. And I'm like, all right, cool. So as soon as I went to uh, college, that was like the first thing I did was found a boxing gym. Mm-hmm. So then I started boxing, doing Thai boxing. And uh, then by the time I was done with pilot training, I got into jujitsu. I was loving jujitsu because it was very much, you know, like wrestling. So, mm-hmm. um, so then I was doing jujitsu and then it just was like the very natural extension of that. Having gone from wrestling to boxing and Thai boxing yeah, and yeah, then the jujitsu. Yeah, exactly. And then I was also doing like a little bit of judo and a little bit of catch wrestling at the same time. So yeah, they all just kind of meld yeah. together, especially with jujitsu and stuff. Um, all right. Look at these beautiful you just loaves look, of cookie. Look pretty. Cookie loaves. You ready? We'll put this in the oven. Do it. I don't know what's going to happen. But yeah, doing like combat sports is there. Like you're saying, there is that point where like you could be in the guard, or whatever. Or you're just completely outmatched. You go, how the hell am I going to get out of this? Like, yep. There's this much more time left, or it's the f- it's the first round, or like we literally just started this match. Like, there's there's no way. Oops. As opposed to trying to trying to set a timer. Or, yep, we're good. Figured and uh, yeah, it's it's just like uh, like when you're boxing with somebody, they just have six seven inches of reach on you just like i can't even get in like this is ridiculous right. just like pound in the face yeah. like oh yeah. fuck like just hit the timer you're like oh two minutes left like fuck oh jesus like all right now <laughs> i just you just like, turn into the turtle minutes. it's like haven't we been here for like 25 minutes yeah <laughs> <laughs> but then you have those, those situations where you flip it around like i remember boxing with this one kid and kate goes he always throws the overhand hook or like the overhand, his his his, he he throw, yeah. it was like cross overhand. Some some it was always like this one punch. So I just went lefty on him, and it, just, it completely took him out of his game. You could see it in his face. He gave up. He had no idea what to do. Yeah. He's like, I don't. I and it was just all yeah. I did was just go lefty, go southpaw. I'm just like jab jab jab, and he just had no idea what to do. So yeah, you get into situations. You have to figure out how to right how to adjust, especially something like martial arts, because every offensive move you make exposes you in some other fashion. That's right. It's so like you go attack, you attack from the right side, and now your left side is open. Yep. That sort of thing. So it's very much like chess. Yes, it's like physical chess, mm-hmm. you know, like with your bodies, which is awesome. And then when you have like multiple disciplines that you're trying to be, you know, like not just proficient, but like really great at, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's just, it becomes like 3D chess, right? Yeah. yeah. And so, and like I remember the first time going, I'm like, I felt really good about where I was. Um, with jujitsu and I'm like, yeah, okay, cool. I'm ready for MMA and then like really getting into it and just like the level of fatigue because now we're jumping up on the ground, jumping up mm-hmm. on the ground and you do that a little bit with jujitsu anyway. Like, you've got takedowns and everything else, but it's different, right? And then like when you're, um, you know, doing Thai and you're just, uh, you know, like, that's exhausting by itself, but now you're not worried about certain moves that are going to, you know, expose you to a takedown in mm-hmm. Thai because you're not taking people down in Thai. Yeah. And so now you're having to watch out for that. And so there's like all of these moving parts and it's just really wonderful, like mental exercise at the same time that it's this physical exercise. And I always said that uh, combat sports are like this great equalizer because if you're this incredibly angry, hot headed person going into it, after a while, you start to really like call. You mellow out. Yeah, you do. Like you see them mellow, right? And then, like on the opposite end of that, people that are very timid that come in now learn these skills that give them all this confidence. Yeah. And now everybody is just like meeting in this really great space. You know, where we're getting our faces beat in, and we love it. You know, that's so. I. Yeah, I always maintain that like, you can yeah. always tell who's never been in a fight or never done any because yeah. they just they talk. They talk so much shit. You're like, you've just never been punched in the face. Yeah. So you go to a gym and like somebody people who've been there for all, nobody's nobody's, nobody's me. Talking, nobody's a no. dick because like oh he just kicked my face and he just kicked my face and that kicked his face and, and like there's a certain <laughs> yeah. pecking order, but everybody's been gotten their ass kicked yep. to some degree. So it's like yeah, there's no right. I mean, of course you get some oh, what's the word some level of of bravado bravado yeah but yeah. like if you're the top dog but at the same right. time you're not the top dog somebody else somewhere yeah. else like oh you're cool here but then you go have a fight right get your face pounded and you're like yeah oh maybe i'm not as good as i thought i was like no you're not yeah it is always an opportunity for humility yeah. in a fight gym yeah right. and it's funny because i would say that um you know i was i was i was a pretty good pilot so i was definitely at a point um you know like in the upgrade system with being a pilot um, where I felt that I was, uh, it's just funny. Like you see like both. Cause on like the one hand, like I would still be like very much not humble, you know, mm-hmm. it's like this badass pilot. Like I'm ready for the I, next step. I, like, I will let me say. Go, right. Like there's definitely like that. But then on the other hand, like I'm, I'm still like actively going and allowing people to, 
you know, just crush my soul at the gym every day. So, I mean, I feel like overall it comes out in the wash. Like I was still pretty balanced as yeah. a person. It, it's funny because my, <laughs> I have a good friend who was in the Air Force and a lot of, he went to the academy and a lot of his buddies were, were pilots. And they were just total dicks. Like, oh, I'm like the coolest person in the world. Like, you're not even flying yet. You're like, you're not even in flight school. <laughs> oh, well, there is definitely that. Like, I will say that all of the new folks coming in, especially, I don't want to say especially the academy. Some of my best friends are academy graduates. But I will say that early on, in their career mm -hmm. before they've really had a chance to like mature in their career that um you know that there is a certain level and it's done on purpose right the academy specifically um you know they want you to be in the military for 20 plus years people mm -hmm. that go to the academy typically have an idea that they're going to it's be there for 20 plus years Full, yeah. yeah and so they give them opportunities that other people don't have and they want them to have that bravado going in because they want them to compete and perform at the very top mm -hmm. echelons of that competition. And so I will say that, um, you know, and, and being young people and feeling very confident above your peers, it's easy to turn confidence into cockiness. Mm -hmm. And so uh, very often I say that you, you probably see it also because at the Academy, they give them opportunities to fly, um, you know, prior. So a lot of us coming from um, university settings don't have any hours going into pilot training mm -hmm. and so these guys already have that so they feel very good going into it um, you know but very similar to a fight gym pilot training is the great equalizer I'm, <laughs> I'm sure you get it's, your fucking yeah, ass handed to you, you do. Like, it's a crucible <laughs> yeah so I saw a top going I went from yeah, <laughs> I went from zero hours to soloing an aircraft in 10 days um, that's pretty quick yeah so it was very very fast um, you know and, and everything that they're training you up to that point is very quick and then, you know, within eight rides, you're doing, um, you know, like emergency procedures, which in the Navy, they actually will like pull in, you know, engine power back on you and you're doing all this stuff like actually up at altitude, mm -hmm. but you're not even necessarily very high up. So I remember this one time I take off and I'm barely 400 feet off the ground, like right in like the takeoff condition and the IP pulls my power back. I was like, all right, good. Like, start start doing your emergency procedures. And when you're only 400 feet off the ground. That's not very far. <laughs> no. And you have no power. And you're like, oh, my God, I'm not ready for this. <laughs> right? But it's do or die. Because if you're going to go out and solo this aircraft, happens, you know, yeah. yeah, then you need to be able to do this. No kidding. And that's, like, the most critical time is because you're in this very, like, high power, below energy state. Mm -hmm. And so if you just lose all of that power and you have this low energy, well, guess what? Like, you are. Just drop out of the sky. Yeah, right out of the sky. Um, you know, and you've got like your nose high up in the air and everything else so you can stall out, you know, and you're just gonna, that's it. You're just gonna fall. So you don't have time to be like, oh no, like you just have to immediately respond. And so they want to teach you that, you know, kind of thing right mm. off the bat. And, um, like that's the kind of thing that if you're not very confident going in, like you're going to have a lot of confidence coming out because you'll be like, throw, throw it at me, throw it at me. Yeah, like, just, I've almost to. fallen out of the sky and, you know, like crushed with, or here's another thing. So they teach you how to, um, you know, like recover your aircraft in uh you know like aerobatics um you know scenarios like in the event that you lose power or uh the aircraft that i was flying was a t-34 charlie um, which is a little turboprop trainer it's a really cool little mm -hmm. airplane um, but it's old it's a really old airplane and so like there's a version of it actually like in the naval air museum like so it's still in operation i flew it this is flown in kitty hawk right? <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> and also by emily elmore in <laughs> 2010 <laughs> <laughs> so if you can imagine like an old um like world war ii warbird like that's what it looks mm -hmm. like <clears throat> and it's old school like that it doesn't have an ejection seat so um the aircraft that i'm an instructor on now the t6 uh texan 2 because the texan 1 actually was a world war ii warbird um but the texan 2 is very very cool it's very like overpowered four blades um you've got an ejection seat it's a really sweet airplane and um, then you've got like the T-34, which kind of looks like the DERPA version of the T-6, mm -hmm. right? And it is very underpowered. It can't do the same types of stuff. And these airplanes have been around so long that I remember flying one that the aircraft skin was just wrinkled. It was like wrinkled Whoa. all the way. Yeah, because it had been it had been over G'd, right? So meaning Holy that like geez. yeah, and so because it had been over G'd, it actually like wrinkled up the skin. But they're like, no, the frame's fine. It's just it's the wood. skin, but it's. Ex <laughs> <laughs> Splinter, we repaired it. Fine. It's so. I'm like, all right, cool. It's like, this is where we're at now. It's like, it's so old, it's wrinkled. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> like, yeah. And, uh, but anyway, so they teach you how to recover from out of control flight because these airplanes are so underpowered and because there's so many engine problems that pop up all the time with them. And, uh, 
anyway, there's this really great story that just, you know, it sticks with me, it cracks me up. Names names will be omitted for their privacy. But uh, anyway, so this guy goes Steve up. Steve Markin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so th this guy's out. It's his first aerobatic solo. And he's going into a loop. Again, this is an underpowered aircraft. So you have to really plan it out. Here's the other thing with the Navy is that they believe um, in terrifying their students. So they don't <laughs> let us fly over 10,000 feet. Because that's the other thing. Like the oxygen system inside of the T-34 is not super very good great. Yeah. Or existent. And so we have to stay under 10,000 feet. And doing aerobatics under 10,000 feet, um, you know, is like air show quality. <laughs> so most people do their aerobatics up above 15 or 20,000 feet. Mm -hmm. And the T-6, it requires it. You have to be up in the high MOA, um, which is an uh, area for flying military aircraft. And so, um, yeah, so we're going at, or well, in this one particular, this was, like I said, this wasn't me. This was um, somebody who had just preceded me by a few months. And so he goes to do a loop and he ends up stalling at the top of the loop, which is something that can happen in this underpowered yeah. aircraft. But what's scary is that as you're doing a loop, so imagine you're flying this loop, right? And you're coming up and you're right at the top and right at this point, like right as you're starting to turn over, your just aircraft dies. just drops out oh, of the Jesus. sky, right? So we're, we're trained how to do this. Like they would practice this all the time. Um, so you'd be up there and then they would just like pull power on you and you'd have to recover. Oh. Yeah, and so, he goes and uh, attempts to do the recovery for it, but he gets himself into a spin. And so now he's in a spin, and he's trying to recover from the spin, but now he is actually putting himself <laughs> into an aggravated spin, right? He does the wrong maneuver again. And so at that point, because he was only at 9,000 feet at the top of that loop, he's already burned up through a few seconds, right, of trying to do the wrong he's, maneuver. Yeah, he's falling. Yeah, and so at around 3,000 feet, he's got to make a decision to bail out. And that's the other thing with this aircraft. There is no ejection. It's bail out like old school World like War II. Like pull the window. Yeah, like pull the, the window, open. take the stuff off, and dive Throw towards the trailing edge of either wing. And then once you, tr once you dive towards the trailing edge of either wing and you're free of the aircraft, then you pull your chute cord. Yes, that's exactly how you do it. And so he makes the call, right, bail out, bail out, bail out. And then he attempts to get out of the aircraft, but he's in this aggravated spin, so it's really it's going. So it's a triple force, right? Pins him up like a Garfield cat. Oh, <laughs> yes. the airplane, right? So he's trying to get out of the airplane, so he's got his cords. He's trying to get out. He's stuck against the airplane. <laughs> but now he's not touching the controls, and this airplane is exceedingly stable because it's a trainer aircraft. So because it is so incredibly stable, once he's no longer putting the wrong control inputs into it the aircraft, straightens out. it straightens out. <laughs> He's so, fine. Everything's fine. So he ends up <laughs> crawling back into the airplane, gets back on the radio, and he's like, uh, um, <laughs> bailout failed. I'm what? just going to fly it home. <laughs> how do you... How do you... <laughs> that, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's a ridiculous story. <laughs> that's, like, <laughs> that's like when we're like, I feel like they're out drinking like, hey, why don't you tell us about that time you bailed... You failed to bail. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. Bail fail. But yeah, we ended up calling it. <laughs> so this guy's last name, we ended up calling it like his last name, the principal. So it's like the, you know, like. Stevenson principal. Yeah, or exactly. The Stevenson principal. You know, so it's like if all else <laughs> fails, it's probably you. Stop touching things and let it see if it'll straighten out without you touching it. I, I just imagine like he's like pinned against it. He's like, ah, oh, fuck. Damn it! Like, gets back in. <laughs> yeah. You're like, That's fucking like, shit! I'm never. They're never gonna let this down. Oh, we're good. All right, we're just gonna, <laughs> we're just gonna hold it back on. Put on with this. Yep. All right. Hey, uh, I'm gonna fly it back home. <laughs> I'm curious yeah. if he was, at what point he went from, or if he ever even had that that freak out point. If it was just like, you know, you just kind of get in that situation, like, all right, oh, I'm, I'm sure. just going I'm sure. through this oh, stuff, yeah. and then you freak out after, like, oh shit, <laughs> like I that just went horribly wrong. If you trust your training, like, you're and you do the training correctly. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, you absolutely experience that freak out. And that's what's so great about the training is that it gives you the opportunity to experience it and then recover. And then like just the amount of confidence that you get from that action is mm -hmm. awesome. So, um, you know, like I remember coming out of, out of a loop once and just being like way too steep, you know, and like actually freaking out about that because I was in, um, you know, like a, an attitude that I didn't want to be at. So 
I'm like, oh man, like I'm really close. I mean, I wasn't really close to the ground, but I was closer to the ground than I wanted to be, mm -hmm. you know, going faster than I wanted to be at an angle that was more aggressive than I wanted to be. And even that is enough to be like, oh no, yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, but you're a new student and it's your first aerobatic solo. And the whole reason that they put you out there in that condition is that it's like, look, you're going to put yourself into, you know, like a unfamiliar um, attitude that you need to fix. And here's, we've given you all of the skills. We feel confident in sending you out in this airplane by yourself, letting you do aerobatics, go nuts, you know, at low, al at low altitudes. Um, you know, and then if you get yourself into something that is uncomfortable, that you're going to be able to recover just fine. And then you do. You're like, oh, mm -hmm. awesome. I, I think the more common case you can probably apply that to somebody who's never going to be a pilot is when you're like on a motorcycle and you hit that oh, turn that's yeah. a little too 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 tight and you didn't hit it you're like oh shit uh what's it called uh target fixation like oh and then you just go all right fuck it turn and you just turn right into it and you're like all right we're good yeah but That's just right. like oh shit this is this is gonna be bad you're like, yeah exactly oh. yeah yep yeah so you're just like oh i'm not ready little too tight yeah. little too fast oh yeah. not yeah. ready and then you just, just yeah and then you out. just right and or you wreck you know one or the, the other, other. <laughs> 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 you can't really fail to bail on a motorcycle. That'd be interesting. <laughs> I mean, you're going to successfully bail out. You're not <laughs> staying on that on it for oh. if, the, if it's bad enough. I, I just, it reminds me, I haven't ridden my motorcycle in a while. It's been sitting in my garage just collecting dust. Yeah, so you're a big motorcycle guy? Not big, but I used to I used to ride. Like It was like my it was my therapeutic yeah. like weekend. Like I just used to jump on that, but now I do this all the time on the weekends. I don't even get out anymore. Especially in Florida, it's, it's it so hot. Yeah, it's, it's gonna go out. It's like, woo, we're out, we're free. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's it's like they say, you never see uh, bikes at a at a psych at a psych or a shrink's office or whatever. Oh yeah, What's the, like, university? right? Yeah, oh, what the hell is it say? I can't remember. I can never remember things that I'm recording. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, it's and it's true. I don't know what it is about it. It's kind of a therapeutic. You just kind like, of become yeah. one with the road, and it just lets you yeah. kind of zen out a little just bit. Leave your phone at home. Yeah. Well, in your backpack in case you get a flat or something. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, so I got a lot of friends with motorcycles. I never had one, but I usually like follow along. I've always had a little stick shift, kind of fun mm -hmm. cars. And, um, I always felt that way about like my, my Mini Cooper. So I had this really sweet 2015 Mini Cooper, a little sport. And when I was up in, uh, Arkansas, you know, up through that whole area is the Wachita Mountains. And then, um, you know, there's the Ozarks further north. Mm -hmm. And so there's just an infinite number of places you can go and drive. And it's just so much fun. It's, you know, just beautiful. The roads are actually in really great condition. So if anyone's saying, oh, Arkansas. Yeah, Arkansas. It is a gorgeous state. It is There's nobody there. There's nobody on the road. <laughs> and the roads are pristine. I mean, they are just smooth, dark asphalt. So if you really want to open it up on a bike, it's like the perfect place to do it. But it's a lot of fun, a little stick shift. Mini so, Cooper also. so talking about like cars and stuff, like how do you get into cars? Like I'm curious because like yeah. I've always been interested, but I don't know. Like what do you just get into it one day? So I would say that it's probably a family affair or like a friend affair mm -hmm. most of the time. Um, so for me, my dad always likes to buy cars and sell cars. So I'm going to tell him to look at this and be like, yeah, you've got like 17 cars in your garage right now, dad. The sickness. It's like a Jay Leno's garage. That's isn't right. It? <laughs> yeah, it's not that many. Um, Three uh, warehouse full. Yeah, but he's he's you know always been like a really big fan of cars. And then for me, I would say that it happened later. Um, I really got the bug. So my grandpa had like an original '65, really like a '64 and a half Mustang. Mm -hmm. It had a little 289 performance engine in it. It was really really cool. Totally stock. Won a lot of stock um, like trophies every time he went out and he showed it. It was pretty cool. So got the original pony seats on the inside and it was just so much fun to drive. And I'd say like I really, there were probably like three vehicles that I learned to drive on. So one was this old Dodge pickup truck, like 1980 something Dodge. One was this 64 and a half Mustang. Um, it's almost like, oh my God, they let you learn to drive in that. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. It was everything your 16 year old experience should be. Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, the other one was this old, like, 60-something Beetle, right, that mm -hmm. I also learned. And, um, you know, those those are also really fun cars, but, like, the stick shifts kind of, like, reverse and, uh, the you know, like, the uh, engines and <laughs> in the back, the back instead yeah, of the yeah. front, right? So there's a lot of, like, these little, like, things about it. But, um, yeah, so those three vehicles are the ones that really taught me how to drive. But the one I was with my 
grandpa, and so it was a lot of fun. And so it wasn't, whenever I think of that car, I don't just think of the car, although it was beautiful and, you know, I could still, like, remember, it's like, I mean, it was, like, pressed leather, like, the pony was, like, mm -hmm. on the leather, you know, I can still remember the way that feels. But besides that, you know, I remember being there with my grandpa and just, like, how excited he was to also get to share, like, this moment with me, mm -hmm. right? So... It's um, so for me, like I, I would say that it really probably started there. And then uh, my high school boyfriend was a mechanic. Also, he was in high school, but he that's how he, you know, this is a high school job. Um, so I wasn't dating like some 30 year old <laughs> mechanic. You're, you're like 11 dating case. some guy who's like 18. Like that's oh, yeah. a little weird. Uh, you know. Nope. Yeah. No, he, uh, so he was really into cars also. So he was, he ended up doing like the diesel mechanic thing. But at the time, like he was just like really smart on cars. And so I got a uh, old F100 which is a Ford truck that was the precursor to the F-150. So it was a 1978, and it was a whole lot of fun. I loved that truck. And um, it requires a lot of tender love and care, and he taught me how to work on that truck. Mm -hmm. So I also have a lot of good memories with that, too, because our friends um, would like to go out to this place called a mud hole, and we would, you know, take our trucks through it. And, um, you know, it's just like kind of stupid Saturday night stuff with a bunch of 16-year-olds. But it was also a lot of fun, and every time I would break it, I could fix it myself, which is like this really kind of fun, empowering thing mm -hmm. to be able to do, you know, and it's like, yeah, like I can work on carburetors. Like that's not something most 16 year old girls can say, you know, and well, I think grown men can't say. Yeah. <laughs> and my, and my mom <laughs> joked about that because I actually ended up having like a, I had some carburetor parts like in my bedroom, like also next to like some makeup and like a hairdryer. And so she like walked in and she's like, I don't know. What is this? <laughs> no, I was like, who are you? Because it's the same mom that said, no, you're not going to box, right? <laughs> so I was like very far departure from like the expectation of like Southern, you know, Texas girls, mm -hmm. which is like where all of my family comes from. So, um, but yeah, and then and I really liked that it was always about community for me. So uh, I feel that most people also think that's true. When I talk to them, if they're like really into cars, they're really into the car community because you can talk to other folks that have a funny story and have, um, you know, an interest in that same car. But it's not because of the car. It's because they also got to drive a really cool Mustang with their grandpa or because mm -hmm. they, um, you know, like know that their mom was saving up forever to have this cool car. And then she got it and just how excited she was to have them drive and just like remembering her joy at that. Right. It's like those mm -hmm. kinds of things that you remember or going out to the track with your dad. Um, so I've met a lot of folks that like to um, either race or they even do like maybe other things like there's the thing called midget car racing, which is like for little kids and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, that's a fun thing to bond over their children with. And then on top of it, their kids are making friends and then the parents are making friends with each other also. So it's always about the community and about the people behind the cars. It, but I think that that's why most people it starts with either family or friends that do it because they pull them into that community. And then all of a sudden there's this really wonderful community built around this thing. You get to also work with your hands and watch it go and, you know, mm -hmm. get to be part of all of the different things that that now gets to take you on to, whether it's a race or if it's a road trip, you know, or if it's, you know, someplace that you just get to get out of the house and talk to somebody that, you know, you care about along the way. So do you think some of that's going to go away with this move towards, <laughs> electric cars like teslas are not even cars really it's just a motor with a computer on it teslas are amazing i mean they are awesome right. yeah so but here's here's what i think is so great about tesla because i'm talking about like this community right tesla i think once we really start this driverless revolution is going to let people that weren't able to drive all of a sudden have intensely more mobility than they had before mm -hmm. so you think about um, you know, people that are no longer capable of driving because of injury or people that are no longer capable of driving because of age, right? And now all of a sudden they don't have to worry about that. They just need to be able to monitor the systems, right? Mm -hmm. And so people like me where I've got, you know, very limited use of my right arm, it's painful for me to drive for any long, you know, distance. So for about two years, I just didn't drive mm. longer than like 20 minutes, unless I had somebody who could go with me. Um, because it was just like that much level of pain. So now like if my family is outside of that little 30 minute, you know, radius, well, I'm not visiting them as often, but you know, it's like, I'm capable of interacting with a Tesla. It's just the pain that I get from, you know, like actively driving for mm -hmm. multiple hours is what I was avoiding. But now I maybe, you know, I'm not feeling like required to, I don't know, restrict myself in that way. So on the one hand, I think Tesla is really great for that. Um, on the other hand, if 
you're a Tesla person and you're kind of snobby about Teslas, because all of my Tesla bros that have Teslas are super snobby about their Teslas. They have like this really great little Tesla community. They know everybody like within 50 miles that owns a Tesla and they meet up. That's because they all have to go to the same charging station. That's right. <laughs> like, oh, your battery died too. Like, oh, I'm here too. <laughs> like, oh, we got 30 minutes to burn. So what do you do for a living? <laughs> yeah. So they, you know, like they, they, but now all of a sudden like they're meeting people that they never would have met otherwise, but by virtue of owning a Tesla, they're meeting each other. And not only that, if you've never actually been in a Tesla, so like the way electric motors work is that there is no like spool up time, right? Like, Mm-hmm. with you know, your kind of typical combustion engine. So because there's no spool up, like there is no like zero to 60. I mean, it just goes so fast. It's yeah, just it's how much power you dump into it. Yeah. And so you're just all of a sudden, and I remember the first time I actually drove a Tesla, I really wish I had, you know, like a GoPro or something in this car, but I didn't because it was like a kind of a, yeah, somebody that I know was like, like, hey, you want to drive it? And I was like, yeah, me, I'm going to go. So, um, so anyway, so I, I, I did that. But I went, the amount of time that it took me to like look left and make sure there was no traffic and then scan for cops, <laughs> right? And I'm like <laughs> accelerating. So I'm going way faster than I'm supposed to. And the amount of time it took me to do a quick cop sweep, I was already at 90 miles an hour. I mean, like literally that fast. It was like maybe four seconds, you know? And so like three and a half seconds, I had hit 60 and then just kept, you know, like blowing through. And so I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. Well, it's, it's funny because I actually heard somebody today talking about how it's so fast. Like, well, imagine like an old person steps on the gas pedal instead of the brake by accident. Like they're just going to take out an entire community of people because That's, it's like, boom. <laughs> right, which is why they need to have the driving, like the driverless ones. Like they need to not be engaged in it at all. <laughs> so bring their community together, but without the risk of them putting their foot on the gas. It's, it's crazy how fast <laughs> yeah. those things are. And it really just, yeah. at that point, it's just traction, really. Because, yeah. Yeah. You, yeah, you, right. people who don't know anything about motors, like, yeah, like you said, you just literally how much power you give it is how fast it'll go. Yes. It's just, like immediately, like just like that. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's crazy. So I think there's still a lot of fun to a Tesla. You know, I mean, for me, I really like a stick shift, even though I can't stick shift anymore. But what I liked about it was that I felt like I was part of the car. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's like you're watching the car. The car isn't like doing things like, uh, you know, autonomously or without you. It's like you are making the direct inputs Melding yourself. That's man right. And machine. Yeah. I think that's part of the reason why people like motorcycles yeah. so much because it's like there is no automatic. That's it's, right. If it is, it's a scooter. And, that's a, and you just kick <laughs> yeah. those over when you're driving past them because fuck those people. I <laughs> <laughs> Why are you in the left lane on a three lane highway? Like, get out of the way. <laughs> So I want to make sure everybody can see them with their little Vespa oh scar, my God. Their, their glasses. I saw a guy one time, he was on a scooter <laughs> with, he had a, like lawn work gloves on and like like swimming goggles or something. Uh-huh. And he's yeah. on the highway doing like Those are going to be some 50. big biscottis. Hmm? Those are going to be some big biscottis. That's what she said. <laughs> I don't know what they That's <laughs> <laughs> She's a big rider. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I understand the melding of... of See, I've, I've never driven stick shift. No? no. Do you know how? No. No? Nobody Just, taught you? I would have to transition from the motorcycle. It's like a man card punch. You're going to have to get it at some point, you know? Well, that's, that's one of those things where... Like, it's been over I, 27 minutes. Do we have to, like, reset? No, nah, I just keep resetting it. Okay. Um, that's like when you're younger, like, oh, I don't get this whole middle age thing. And then you start getting older. Yeah. And, like, now I'm going to be 33, and I'm like... I've never had that nice car. I've never had that sports car. I've right. never had that yeah. stick shift. I've never had that experience of it's just not like midlife crisis. It's the fact that you've got money now. Well, that yeah, it's, it's <laughs> like, like I can go out and buy that cool car or that cool experience that I wasn't yeah. able to have. Well, before. I think a lot of that too is is you end up chasing that quote unquote that corporate like oh you have to get a job and you have to do this and you do yeah. all that and you get to that point like I'm not happy with what I'm doing and like I don't like this stuff like oh, I never had that car as a kid or as a yeah. teenager kind of thing and yeah. like all right I'm gonna go get that sports car. Well, see, that's kind of some stuff we talk about, like with Moto Dolls, because I find with these organizations, some of these people, especially if it's like their own organization Mm -hmm. or, um, you know, somebody else that's like kind of mid-level management, they're like, man, I'm just running this rat race. And I thought for sure, it's like, hey, you've got to reach A, B, and C before you get to be considered successful. And they're like, I hit A, B, and C, and I feel feel like I'm stuck. Like, I feel like I'm just in a rut or that I'm just spinning my wheels and I'm not going, uh you know, in the direction that I want to go, even though I couldn't tell you exactly what that direction should be because I've hit all of the things that people told me. Yeah, you hit your milestones. Yeah. And so that goes back to kind of finding the root cause. It's like, bro, what makes you happy? And if there's a level of provision that you need for your family and so you're like, hey, I don't have the flexibility to leave this job or to do, you know, X, Y, Z hobbies because I've got to spend more time with my kids or I've got to Mm -hmm. make sure that I'm, you know, making X amount of dollars to keep them clothed and everything. 
um, you know, then at that point you just try to find like ways that you can make small change over time. But really I think it's a growth, you know, like a personal growth. So it's like, even if you're like fine, satisfied enough with your job, if all that you've been doing and all that you've made time for is your job and you're looking for something else that helps you to grow past, um, you know, just where you're at now and give you like that really great sense of satisfaction and accomplishment, a lot of times that's something that you want to do on your own. So it doesn't matter if it's, you know, learning how to work Adobe Photoshop and making like really cool design or if it's, uh, you know, that you want to write or if it's, you know, maybe opening up your own business completely separate and distinct from corporate that you've been doing. You know, it's one of those things like small changes over time amount to big change, you know. So I think that that's one of the things though is that we build all of these steps and milestones based off of somebody else's definition of success and then we get so wrapped around the axle playing by their rules that we miss out on all the things that really matter to us along the way and that we're just not maybe smart enough to see it until you know mid-30s <laughs> the 40s or later and so then we go out and get a really cool car <laughs> yeah i think some of that's been um i can't remember these words anymore um exacerbated yeah, that's a good one. By the fact that all this social media stuff, so it's like, because I had one of those instances like a couple weeks ago. I was like, man, I've been doing this for X amount of time and I have nowhere near the amount of, of traction that some people have been doing this for like two months. Yeah. Like, what? what's the difference? Like, and you try to get, and you get stuck in this comparison point and it's, it's just pointless. Where are we at here? How are they looking? Do you, do you have like a, um, a little toothpick or something? Yes. Maybe. Actually, you can use this. This is actually a cake tester. <gasps> Wonderful. Kind of looks Courtesy like. Courtesy of, of my ex girlfriend. Kind of looks like. Who was a chef. Oh, yeah. That's, that's good. Then we're going to let it cool completely. In the oven or? No, I'm going to pull it out as soon as I get a uh, hot mitt. I have no hot mitts. Oh. What are you going to do? Like pull it out with your like strong hands? Yeah. <laughs> it's how I train <laughs> for. for <laughs> I was going to say, you've been doing this so long that you've got like those crazy chef hands. All right, we're just going to leave the 350 on. Yep. Yeah. And then, so once it cools, then we'll cut it, and then we'll put it back in and let it... And that's when it's going to get real pretty. That looks pretty good. It smells delicious. Yeah. Giant cookie loaf. <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, <clears throat> do you Do you like cookie cakes? Oh, like those big cookie cakes? Yeah. I don't know. The jury's out. I feel like the they're waste. Had, yeah, they've never really been. You know what it is? I, it's that I like like the gooey center. So if I could like maybe just cut out the edges, I would be happy with the center of it. Mm -hmm. But I like smaller cookies because I don't want to have like half of my little cookie slice to be outer edge. It's all hard. And... So is it the same for brownies? Yeah, I You're also don't like person. the edge of. Yeah, I'm also That's not an edge. Part. See, it's well, it's, it, it depends because it's like a chocolate chip cookie. Like you have a little bit of crunch on the outside, but you got to have that gooey middle. I feel like, yeah, you're like one or the other. Like, there's there's never a person that is cool with edges and the middle. It's like, oh, I guess I guess edges like are, I, you know, I'll eat it because I like brownies. I mean. No, if I could, I would just like cut out. If you had this big square of brownie, I would just cut this piece out and take that for myself. Oh, yeah. See, so, yeah, I would take the edge. Really. Yeah, well, look, we're like a match made in heaven. I'm curious I'll just, why. I'll take, the, I'll take the center out, and you can have all the leavings. I'm curious what <laughs> what in, like, your childhood establishes the kind of person you are, if it's just, just like, a genetic thing, like, oh, crunchy, or, like, oh, gooey. Yeah, um, it's probably if your mom overbakes things or not. <laughs> it's... it's it tastes Maybe. like nostalgia. It tastes like mom spent it, too it much time in. It probably is, because yeah. that's like, uh, <laughs> I used to eat steaks really well done, because my family just, I mean, you can have a really nice steak, just charred. It's a piece of rubber. Oh, and for scary. the longest time, I was like, I hate steak. Like, it's just this, I don't like steak. And then you have a good piece of steak, like, cooked oh, well, and you're like, this is delicious. <laughs> yeah. That's how I felt about vegetables for a long time. Yeah. That's that's a, that's one that's very yeah like oh this is nasty but then you have like roast broccoli or something like this is delicious yeah so like, we always so had either like frozen or in the can and then like the first time we had, it was like really like fresh vegetables mm -hmm. like roasted like vegetables. the snaps and flavor yeah. to it or, like oh, color gosh, yeah or like the first time I had real Brussels sprouts I was just like mm -hmm. what what this is not the Brussels sprout of like your that I remember at all like this thing's amazing or, or the green beans the gray ass green beans uh, you get in cans yeah. That's like green bean casserole. Like, it's like, I don't, I don't yeah, think no, it's, yeah. but then again, I don't think I've ever really had a good one. Like buttery and yeah, it's 
it's great. Hmm. It's always interesting seeing that stuff. Yeah. Like who, how you, what you ate growing up and how it affects your current nutrition, if it does at all. <laughs> like, like, oh, mac and cheese, and they pull out the easy mac. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I feel like there's a certain it. amount. So this is funny because, um, so we ate a lot of, like, you know, frozen stuff growing up. And oh, <laughs> in the military, we call them gerbils. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because they're basically, it's chicken cordon bleu, but it is not any semblance of real chicken cordon bleu. It is like that kind of porous, Sponge, spongy, yeah. mm-hmm. like spongy It's like they chicken. grind it up. It's like a That's chicken right. nugget. Yeah, they shape it, you know, and then they put in like this processed cheese on the inside mm-hmm. and like spam, right? So it's spam, processed cheese, and then uh, like porous shaped chicken with some breading. And it looks like a little gerbil body. It's like this big and it's like perfectly round and it's kind of fuzzy. Good, they're they're actually pretty yeah. good right? yeah yeah and so and i think like if you had them as a kid you're like those are good you take it back right it's yeah. not garbage food at all well so gerbil night you know at like the afghanistan chow hall is like just everybody's super stoked about it because we all remember it from like when we were kids mm-hmm. you know but it is i mean it's just it's really like garbage food when you think about it right spam processed cheese and like porous sponge chicken and anybody that's like never had it would probably think it was also garbage. But if you like ever had it as a kid, or even if like you know you're even just, as an adult, if you drink too much, good. I mean. <laughs> and you need something to eat at three a.m., then yes, it's fantastic. Although I feel like if you're eating at three a.m., you're probably gonna burn your mouth because you you're like, Overdone, oh, I'm yeah. so hungry, and you're like, oh, yeah, you like, uh, pull it out like a uh, hot pocket, and you pull it out. She yeah. freaks out. <laughs> um. That stuff is good. Like yeah. drinking Sunny D as a kid. I still remember that. That's yeah. Just... And you're like, I'm sure it's, it's, you know what? Actually, I Ugh. had recently. That was good because sometimes you eat something. You're like, oh, yeah. Like a uh, like those little squeezy. Even like those little squeezy. Yeah. Those so, things. Yeah. So like grapes, like some kind of like grape drink of some kind. Right? <laughs> it doesn't even, yeah, it doesn't even say juice. It's drink. <laughs> it's like not drink. even ice cream. It's like Purple dairy drink. dessert. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I remember like having one of those thinking it was going to be good and it was awful. But then... I had strawberry milk, like strawberry quick. Oh, jeez. And it is just as delicious as I remember it being. So if you ever liked strawberry milk. Yeah. That, yeah. You should well, re- revisit that because it was so pretty good. You want to have your mind blown is have the Spanish Nesquik, the chocolate. Oh. Like if you ever buy it by action, like this doesn't taste right. It's a completely different formula from the really? classic. Yeah. Because oh. like, why does this taste so weird? And like, like Spanish Coke. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> very. Yeah. Very much so. It's like, this is odd. Like, I don't like this. Huh. Man, strawberry milk. I haven't had that in. Yeah, because like holy shit, that's like throwback thing. Yeah, and so I saw it. and I was like, you know what? Because it was another like a little pregnancy gem. So I had this weird like strawberry thing, like whenever I was pregnant with my baby. And so I was like, I did all the strawberries, like fake strawberries. Bring it, you know. <laughs> and so I was like, yeah, strawberry milk. And so we still have like this big giant thing. But I'll I'll drink, you know, a little cup of it on occasion but like during during pregnancy i was just like ah so much milk so are much you strawberry at the, catering. Uh, are you at the capri sun stage yet with your kids no well like on occasion my two-year-old will have some we just don't do a whole lot of juice mm-hmm. but i mean capri suns are still actually pretty delicious also so well once they start doing like sporks and stuff it's like yeah. here's pretzels and the capri sun like can i have another one <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> So many. But trying to stab yourself. Have they have they improved on that at all? Like no, the whole I don't think stabby so. thing? I think it's still a stabby stabby straw. You just stab it on the bottom instead of like the little hole on top that you can never get it through. No, I'm pretty sure it's the exact same terrible design. It? Yeah, it's it's an awful design that works. You know? Huh? You think they would have improved on it by now? Yeah. It's only been so. like thirty years I've been doing it. Yeah. No, I think it's still just as terrible as it's ever been. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's horrible. Uh, so, what do we do with this stuff? How do we? Are we gonna? How do, how do you typically dip them? Oh yeah, so we're gonna heat that bad boy up. We can do that a couple different ways. We can heat it up on the oven if you're. Uh, I don't think you have a microwave. No, perfect. We'll do it on the. Yeah, we'll do I, it. I have no microwave, and I don't know if you noticed, I have no pantry. Yeah, <laughs> that's. I mean, but you have all of this self, shelf space. So and no perfect. cabinet doors because I haven't finished remodeling. This. No, you tell them everybody that so it's more easily accessible while you're doing your podcast without having to slam the doors uh, it's debatable yeah no it's good it's better to do it uh on the stove anyway than the microwave but i know some people are like oh we'll just do it the faster way so yeah no we'll, um after we uh put it back in the oven to crisp up then we'll heat that stuff up and once we pull them out and it's all nice and soft then we'll pull those and just kind of 
dip them in. Do you do like the half dip, like lengthwise, like halfwise? Oh, there's drizzle? a couple different ways, you know? I mean, there's like kind of the bottom, very fancy, like Starbucks coffee kind of way, right? Where it's like all like along the bottom. Or mm-hmm. yeah, you just do like kind of half, half dip. Like the half ass, like half dip. Yeah, yeah, the half dip. <laughs> you only enjoy half of this biscotti. Yeah, and then some people do like crazy stuff. Like they'll like crunch the rest of the stuff up and they'll kind of sprinkle it on there. So it looks Should you do like a tuxedo? Decorative. Should have gotten some white chocolate. Tuxedo biscotti. That would have looked nice. That would have been interesting. Yeah, that would have been pretty. Hmm. Yeah, the other way that people will do it, so they have an even amount of delicious chocolate as they're dipping it through uh, their coffee, is that they'll just kind of like scoop up and then they'll just kind of drizzle just like that. Yeah, very fancy. I'm not a chocolatier. Mm, me either. So when they say let cool completely, do they mean like let be cold? I don't know. I feel like I could probably cut into this. Um, yeah, that's, that's doable. Yeah. <clears throat> so the big trick is that we need a... I, so some people like to do it with a serrated bread knife. I think it should be soft enough. I just like to do it with a big enough knife that I can just cut all the way through. So if you've got like a butcher knife, that will be perfect. Excellent. Yeah, that will work just fine. No, I, I like I said, because it's still a little soft. Like I would, I just, yeah, I think that's actually perfect. Cool. If you want a real samurai sword knife. I mean, that would also be very cool. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Now, can you eat this now, or do you think it's like. Oh, you totally could. It's just going to be like a soft cookie. Do you want to try some? Yes. Yeah. Let's cut that thing in half. And then we'll just eat it on the way. There you go. You can tell me what you think. Oh, it's perfectly edible. Yeah. It tastes like, um... It's kind of a sugar cookie. It's kind of plain. It's like if you had a, like a biscuit, almost. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like you were trying to make chocolate chip cookies, but you got confused with the biscuit recipe halfway through right. and then made a cake. Yeah. It's kind of like a scone. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. <laughs> it's another scone like. Oh, it's a good piece. That's really good. Nope, that one broke a little bit. It's alright. You got it. Let me cut this other one. A little broke, no big deal. So you cutting, cutting at an angle? Yeah, I do it at just a little bit of an angle to give it the classic biscotti look. I wonder how many Italians are like, you're doing it wrong. I know, I'm trying to look at it and be like, you guys suck. I think I took too much of an angle here. It looks beautiful. I think you're making perfect biscottis. All right, and then we just put these bad boys just like so. Uh, here, I'll take just this little tiny piece here. Yeah. Oops, that one broke. Motor's gonna have to eat it. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> mm. Nope, careful. It really is like a scone. No. Dang it. I don't know why I'm like cutting in half with my hand. That's good. Oh. Yeah, little little hassy pieces. It's perfect. Classic biscotti look. Beautiful. Money. Yeah. I mean, it'd be good to coffee just like that. And timer. Oops. 
10 minutes on one side, flip it, 10 minutes on the other side, and we're golden. I feel like that's kind of like Doritos. Like, if it's not a full chip, it doesn't count as a chip. Yeah. That's why you crumble the bag before and then you the, open it. And then the calories don't count either. Mm hmm Yeah. Just like if it's not your bag, it doesn't count. Yeah, that's like my that's like my diet plan. I don't do specific diets. I just don't eat really whole of anything, so that way calories never count. <laughs> this is supposed to be dark chocolate, but I don't think it is. Does it say semi sweet? This is dark. <laughs> mm. I like dark. I like semi sweets actually, like a dark chocolate. I'm always like, oh no, I got semi sweet. It's like oh, semi sweet dark. Well, it's melting, so the first ingredient is sugar, which is always comforting. Oops, I broke that one. That's all right. There will definitely be some pretty ones for you to, like, take pictures of. Mm, that's true. Which will be good. There's also a, a few broken ones, but they're easier, in my opinion, anyway, to kind of to store. Like, nobody's got, I mean, unless you were storing them, like, in this, most people don't have, you know, kind of like a... But here's the thing is it's, it's not going to last long enough to store. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm going to eat all of it. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. <laughs> I mean, I have to bring some for Kay, too, so. No, oh, we just tell it didn't work out too well. We'll just edit it, pretend like they fell on the floor or something, and Jake ate them. That's right. Okay. And timer. Here we go. Very nice. All right. So, if you want to. Mm, something's... Nope. <laughs> first thing first. Kind of crucial. Yeah. See? No, so that's like the first thing. Before they're asking for help, I'm like, ah. So I'd say that's one of the things like with cars, which is always so fun also, is that especially if it's like an older car, like, I don't understand what's wrong. It's like, hey, man, is check there's gas in it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, damn it. I drained everything out. I know. That's fine. You, you got to put that back in. No. Do you reattach the spark plugs? Oh. <laughs> no, it's like the like the like the first like the most easy thing first, and it's like, oh dang it! I've actually done that before. I forgot to reattach spark plugs after like pulling everything out and putting mm -hmm. it back in. It's like why? My 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 gripe with that stuff is like nowadays, like when your battery's dying, like on these new cars, the car's just dead. It doesn't turn over. Nothing like rah, 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 rah. it's just bloop. Like oh, I think something else went bad. Like, so what do I do here? No. Do I push boil? Uh, I think there's the power button. Got the power. So that's good. And then boil? And the, I don't know if... Yeah, I guess boil. I'm not sure. This is, this is an experiment in... I mean, it's sweet. Utility. And now... But seriously, it's not like increasing. Nope, that's off. That's on. Like I said, I've, I've used this a couple of times and I still don't know how to use it. Because I refuse to read directions for it. It's like pick a number. Ooh. It's like, well, okay. All right. Menu is the only thing that works. It's temp. There's like a simmer. There's like a maintain. There's a warm. I'm not sure. <laughs> you can come and show me. It says E0. I don't know what that's all about. So the only button that's working for me is menu. It says E0. So I'm wondering if it's like an error thing. This is many times I just pull it out and plug it back in because I can't figure out what the hell it's doing. Is Maybe it doesn't want anything on there. Yeah, we'll do it. I'll go. <laughs> okay, so it wants a menu. What is EO? Oh, it's like an error message. It's okay. We can use the stove like old school. This was really neat. Screw it. I don't. I don't know what's wrong. With it. Oh well. To the stove. To the stove. This new thing will take my Never works. Sorry. I'll just turn the face towards the. And much. now we are melting the very fancy Giratelli <laughs> dark melting wafers. You can choose whatever dark melting wafers you want. It's like fancy piece. That's right, but I do recommend that you go with a delicious chocolate that you can dip your biscotti in. Because while a scone is fine by itself, everything is much better when it is dipped in dark chocolate. I don't have to worry about if the flavor's good. 
Do you want this? I don't know what this is. No. <laughs> it's probably from. We'll go with this guy. It's probably from dinner or something. Probably. Step two keep a clean workspace. Uh, you know, creative outlet. Is it truly, uh, you know, like money and fame? Or is it like truly a blend and then like how much of it is a blend, right? So <clears throat> like the way I like to think about it is if you can make an inferior product, but you could have like a million likes tomorrow uh, and thus convert and then convert that into money because that's the thing that matters, right? Um, would you choose to do that even though you knew that you were making an inferior product? It's hard, right? It's hard to make that decision. It depends, because it's one of those like, well, is this going to sustain me while I do a non create a non inferior product, or? So if you're if you're willing to accept to make an inferior product, in like with the intent of making it like super balling later, I mean that's one thing. But I mean that's one of those dangerous like you know road to hell with you know paying yeah. good intentions, right? Because that's the same reason that a lot of people get into politics is that and then they realize, hey, I'm gonna have to accept some of these bad policies in order to get this guy to vote on this policy for, you know, the people that I'm representing. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden now there's all this like tit for tat, like what am I willing to accept or not to accept? Yeah. And so the thing that is the most important to you is what are you deriving the most satisfaction from? If your motivation is to get to a point again, like by trying to like root down is it a like for the sake of like, like to boost your self-esteem? Mm -hmm. Or is it a like for the sake of being able to convert that into dollars that will allow you to sustain yourself doing this full time because you don't want to do your corporate job anymore? Because mm -hmm. if that's really what it is, then yeah, maybe you're willing to accept an inferior product if for whatever reason, you know, it was to be more popular for a little bit in order to convert a little faster in order to be able to do this full time, in which case, it's really that you don't like your job. That's like really like the big thing, right? Like <laughs> then you, you, you pull back enough layers and that's what you find out. Yeah. And so, you know, and that's kind of what we do. But when you're like just really passionate about something, you know, then it's like, all right, I will accept that I am doing it at this caliber, doing it on my terms and like this really awesome setup. And I have so much fun meeting people and, you know, like doing new things. Um, that it's fine if I have to go a little bit longer also doing my other job because I'm doing it the caliber that I want to be doing it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, and, and you feel good about it. But <clears throat> like I said, so it's, it's one of those things like getting to the root cause will maybe help you to make the decisions or know exactly where to invest your money in mm -hmm. the most. Because if it's really just a matter of like, I mean, so I don't know if we can edit this out if you want, but your setup here is amazing, right? Like your setup's great. So really what I would say is maybe like the advertisement component of it. Mm -hmm. if, you, if, it's about, if it's about money, like if you're looking to start converting um, this so, so that you can sustain yourself full time and get outside of your corporate job. Like if you like your corporate job and this is just a hobby, that's one thing. But if you're saying, hey, corporate is fine, corporate's corporate, but man, if I could do this full time, it could just take off. And even if it wasn't necessarily this show, but I could just get involved in like, you know, endeavors that are my own endeavors and mm -hmm. getting to do it on my terms and my yeah. timeline, right? And I could do that full time. The man I would, I'd take that in a heartbeat. Um, you know, then like what we're talking about is maybe advertisement, right? So it's like, hey, you don't need a better camera. What you need is to drop 800 bucks in social media advertising. And then you want to make sure that you're picking like the exact right spot for that kind of stuff. Yeah. So that's what I do, right? Performance brand, because a like for the sake of a like isn't what I do, right? Um, well, it doesn't mean anything nowadays. That's it's right. Like you just yeah. Double tap and armor. It's, it's a, literally a fleeting moment in somebody's. Yeah. So somebody's like day. for, so for me, it's like I like I said, I help people like with performance. So if they really like their job at work, but they're feeling like they're kind of in a rut, and really it's because they just need to actively grow a different facet of their personality, mm -hmm. then something like this might be fun just for the sake of getting out there and actually getting to produce a show and do the show and meet the people. Like the sake of production is actually what's the most important thing for them. Having something to make money for that gets them really excited about the weekends because that's when they get to do it. Mm -hmm. Like then, then that's what we're doing, right? And by doing that, they're now like totally re-engaged in work because they're re-engaged in like, you know, purpose for the money, right? Purpose for that. And they're always looking for opportunities with people at work um, to maybe bring them onto their show and to get them excited about that. And so if that's really what it is, 
then the production, even though like, they're spending all this money on this stuff, it's, and if they can make money, if they can monetize their hobby, super. But that's really all it is. It's that they're looking for an opportunity to grow themselves. Oh, that's hot. To grow another facet of their personality. Um, you know, that they don't want to feel like they're just meeting, um, you know, performance metrics that are dictated to them on a game that wasn't their choosing, right? Mm -hmm. So now all of a sudden I get to change the game a little bit. But if they want to change the game a whole lot of it, they're ready to take a leap and do things on their own, then they may do that in kind of a traditional business setting where they have a physical product to sell. Or, you know, they might be selling entertainment like this, you know, teaching people, um, you know, how to cook or giving them a usable skill that they can get. Then again, if you've got clever enough branding, maybe you can get people so into watching this that they want to, you know, have mugs by you and spatulas by you and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So then maybe that's where you're making your money. So that's where kind of like my stuff comes in is it's really getting down to the root analysis of, uh, like, why is it that you feel like, where do you want your performance to be? Why do you want your performance to be there? And then getting to the root cause of how we can make that happen and mm -hmm. getting like metrics worked out along the way in order to reach it. That makes sense to you and or like get you excited again about like the next step. So I think that's something that a lot of people are really just missing. I think yeah. a lot of people are li like missing hobbies in general. I think people just need more hobbies in general, like opportunities for growth, like just to learn a skill for the sake of learning something new because it's fun. I think that's one of the reasons I've been doing this for over uh, a year now is yeah. because of the fact that I usually go through like three month sprints. I'll try something and I'll get decently good at it to where like the next step is like, all right, now this is taking it to almost uh, like a position, like a job thing. It's like, ah, I'm done with it. So I usually get three months, like I'm out of whatever it is. But I've been doing this now for like a year yeah. just because like the, the ways of doing things are so different. Like just, just a different style of video. It's a completely new, like learning experience in a way. It's been really interesting seeing, like going back and watching some of my earlier stuff. It's like, well, this is that was complete crap. <laughs> in all sense, <laughs> it's just interesting. I don't want that to burn. It's pretty, pretty toasty, and it's excellent timing because in forty-five seconds we're gonna bring these little beasties out and drizzle them with some delightful gear deli. Switch this those. camera over here. Oh yeah. Um. I don't like mine like brick hard. Yeah, it's not oh. that fun with. Some people do. Yeah. When like, you're eating like a. Yeah. The snapping rock. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna practice my drizzle technique here in the chocolate. It's all in the wrist. It's all in the it's wrist. It's all in the wrist. I knew what I'm doing. Okay. Ready? I don't want to start the drizzle without the cameras being on. No, I think we're good. Okay. So you have several options with a delicious biscotti. You can choose to dip it. Um, I can't say that I've ever successfully dipped um, the long way because they, especially longer ones, tend to break um, pretty easily. But sure there's fancy ways to do that. I just don't. I don't want like excessive amounts of chocolate. It's nice just to have a little drizzle though. Makes your regular coffee more like a mocha. It's hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Well, you've had some, were you, like how, how fancy of a coffee drinker were you, are you? Uh, yeah, so I guess it kind of depends. Um, I had some really fancy coffee. <laughs> The other day in Tampa, like cold brew that they do like some kind of like nitrous kind of experience mm -hmm. so that it's like heat never actually touches the bean. It's amazing. It tastes really good. So I'm always willing to try like really fancy coffees. Um, but if it's just like a really good brewed bean, I, I like just coffee black. So it just kind of depends. If the coffee isn't very good, then I need it to be pretty fancy to overcome the bitter taste of the, the coffee the crappiness of the Folgers yeah <laughs> or even some of your more name brand types you know like if you can say it or not but I, I don't think that Starbucks coffee by itself is very good I will very rarely drink a cup of Starbucks coffee black oh it, it's undoable 
yeah. Well, the stuff you get at the store is really dark because they know people are going to add a bunch of sugar and milk to it. Yeah. If you buy the whole beans, it's actually a lot better. Oh, really? Is, yeah. Because I guess they go under the assumption of like, oh, if you're buying this whole, you have some grinder and you probably are somewhat more uh, enlightened in yeah. the coffee game. More enlightened in the coffee game. It's true. Like, are you doing a Comex pour over? Like, what? how fancy are we getting? Yeah, it's it's funny because it, knowing Rishi and the whole coffee thing is it's like you don't know what you don't know until somebody shows you. You're like, whoa, this is a whole world. Like I didn't, I, don't, yeah. I did not know it went this deep. Yeah, so I didn't realize like okay, it was like roasting. When she said roasting, I'm like, oh yeah, like personal roaster, maybe like a popcorn maker throwing in some whole <laughs> beans, you know, and then. She let me try some. I'm like, oh my god, like this is really good. And then <laughs> all of a sudden, I realized that the coffee that we were drinking came in like you know boxes and all like, these really fancy uh, like you know something you'd buy at a store. And I'm like, oh my god, like this is your coffee? She's like, yeah. Like the world needs to know about this coffee because it's really good. Yeah, I remember reading something one time. There, this person was trying to get you know into coffee, and and one of the pers- one of the people replied with. First thing you need to do is get rid of the packing material you use to drink your coffee out of. Like it's so styrofoam as it's packing material. Like don't yeah. don't use that. That's junk. Yeah. That looks fantastic. I maybe melted more chocolate than we actually need. I don't know. <laughs> oh, what did Travis do? We have know. to eat chocolate. Oh man. Yeah, I don't know what we're gonna do with all this chocolate though. I, mean, I could definitely put some more chocolate on this side just like throw one in there just roll around just the whole thing yeah just like it's like, like one of these small ones and just dump it in there doing it you say chocolate biscotti yeah. that's gonna be the best one <laughs> i mean yeah look at this guy <laughs> what is that chocolate hardens oh that'd be fantastic oh yeah here we go we don't want any biscuit leaking out okay it needs to be completely covered in the chocolate biscuit leaking out <laughs> Here, I'll put some more what does biscotti well. mean? It probably does mean just biscuit in probably. Italian. Yeah, mini, little biscuit, biscuit treat. I don't know. There you go. This will look lovely. That looks fantastic. You want to get some of that chocolate out there? Uh, yes. <laughs> I feel like I need to get a spoon there, or else it's gonna be messy. Uh huh. Just... Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Actually, and it's dark chocolate. It's good for you. I'm pretty sure that means you can eat the whole bowl and nothing bad will happen. Except diabetes. <laughs> diabetes. Diabetes. <laughs> diabetes. You just die from yeah. diabetes. Like this little piece. That definitely needs a dip. Oh, yeah, babe. That's actually really good. You should do that too. It's a pretty good little croutin cookie. <laughs> Hashtag croutin cookie. Hashtag. Well, thank you for coming and cooking some biscotti. Um, thank you for inviting me. It's fantastic. Yeah. If you want to plug your website and hashtag Instagrams, all that stuff again. Oh, sure. Yeah. All the things. So if you too would like to find ways that you can better your own performance, whether it is in the kitchen or doing something else like inside of corporate or your own personal endeavors, then please come check me out at the motodoll.com. That's the M O T O doll.com. And you can also find me on all things hashtag at the Moto Doll. So either one of those, it's either hashtag the Moto Doll, at the Moto Doll, you'll be able to find me at YouTube, Insta, or all of those other wonderful things. And I will see you out there. <laughs> so it's fantastic when you're like <laughs> Pinterest, this, mm. Twitter, Instagram, uh, Friendster, yeah. Facebook, all that stuff. But I just yeah. say all the things. Yeah. Hash- hashtag, hashtag all the things. Hash- sh- what is it? Share and subscribe. Share and subscribe. And Share and subscribe. Retweet. Yeah. Pin. Awesome. But yeah, thank you for coming. It was fantastic. Hey, well, thanks for inviting me. This was actually a whole lot of fun. And I had nothing to do this morning. And this was able to uh, get me away from Scary Bride. Trying to keep... Bridezilla. Trying to keep it together. 
<laughs> oh man, it's too funny. Don't tell her I said that. You edit that shit out. Uh, we'll see. <laughs>